Okay, good afternoon. Thanks for coming to this session. I'm DJ Zhou, a professor at the Department of Political Science and International Relations, Seoul National University. I'm delighted to serve as a moderator for this session. I have had a chance to read two sets of presentation slides and the draft. Ms. Alison Sawanski deal with China's course of economic uh, statecraft directly, and two professors deal with neighboring states' reaction to China's economic state, uh, statecraft. So uh, for a better discussion, I'd like to change the presentation order. Dr. Sawanski, Sawinski starts first, then Professor Yi Suyun will be the second presenter, and Professor Yi Wang Yi will be the last presenter. Uh, before uh, coming to this session, I have not met, uh, I have met only two panelists. So Professor Yu Suyun and my old friend, uh, Professor Yi Wang Yi. So it may be, it may be uh, not fair for me to, uh, to introduce the panelists. So I'd like to ask panelists uh, to introduce yourself when you discuss or present. So this is the ground rule for this session. You will listen to three presentations in a row. After the last presentation is over, we will have panel discussion. If it is available, the floor will be open to our audiences. Each presenter has maximum 70 minutes, including your own introduction. Each discussant has maximum seven minutes, including your own introduction. So without any further delay, Let's move on to the first presentation. So, Ms. Alison Saransky, put it, Ms. Yours. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you said, my name is Alison Salwinski. I'm the Vice President for Research at the National Bureau of Asian Research. Uh, it's a policy research organization based in Washington, D.C., and we also have an office um, in Seattle, Washington. Um, my personal background uh, is uh, the study of uh, China and its interactions with U.S. allies and partners in primarily in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and today uh, my focus is a little bit outside of the area I usually examine, um, but I think has some really important implications um, for broader uh, strategic and geopolitical issues. Um, so hopefully we can dive into some of those as we discuss um, uh, the, the range of statecraft behaviors uh, across this panel today. Um, let's see. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna focus today on uh, China's economic coercion and coercive behavior um, China use, China's use of economic punishment towards states that are perceived to have wronged it has been a notable tool of its statecraft. The list of countries that have been on the receiving end of Beijing's economic coercion has grown quite long. Korea, Japan, Norway, Taiwan, Canada, Lithuania, Australia, among many others, have all been targeted by uh, Chinese import or export restrictions, tourism curbs, popular boycotts, and increased trade barriers. The cumulative economic effects in each case have been variable, uh, but often they end up being less significant than feared uh, to the overall econ economy of the targeted country. And in many cases, Beijing has failed to achieve direct uh, political objectives from the targeted country. However, China's overarching goal in the use of these tools is much broader, um, encapsulated by the Chengyu uh, Shaji Jingho, to kill the chicken to scare the monkey, so hence the title here. Um, today, I'm going to discuss the strategic goal that China pursues in its use of economic coercion and uh, the effects of that on third party states um, who have economic interdependence on China. And I also touch on some policy implications for the United States, the ROK, and other like-minded countries as they consider strategies to bolster resilience and uh, prevent China's economic threats. Let's see. Oh, let's go back. 
Okay. So um, briefly, I just want to review what we mean here by economic coercion. Uh, for our purposes here today, I will focus exclusively on uh, coercion against states and foreign governments, leaving aside the many other cases in which China uses economic tools to pressure and coerce companies or private actors to alter their actions. So according to Dan Dresner, economic coercion is a tool of economic statecraft which entails a threat or act by a government to disrupt economic exchange with the target state unless the target acquiesces to an articulated demand. And I'll get back to that uh, articulated demand component a little bit later. Economic coercion can have the effect of punishing, influencing, deterring, um, or some combination of these, the, the foreign government uh, being targeted. And China's efforts at economic coercion have included measures such as import and export restrictions, investment restrictions, tourism curbs, popular boycotts, and increased trade barriers. According to a report by the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, since 2020, 19 countries, sorry, since 2010, 19 countries and the European Union have been targets of China's economic coercion. From 2020, till today, uh, so just the past few years, Australia has been the country subjected to the most actions, while Europe has been the most targeted region. As you'll see um, in the next graph that I'll show, um, there's been a notable increase in the number of incidents of Chinese economic coercion, which began in about 2018 and reached a peak in 2020. And they have remained at pretty high levels since then. So this graph, which ASPE produced, um, shows the PRC's increased application of economic coercion since 2010. While the number of recorded coercive actions has actually dropped uh, since the peak there in 2020, the counts for both 2021 and 2022 remain well above the numbers observed before 2019. What's clear from uh, this is that economic coercion is now a pretty established part of the PRC's toolkit, and one which we can likely expect to see a continued application of in the coming years as China continues to assert its preferences and pursue its interests around the globe. All right. So this map is just a snapshot to show kind of the range of countries uh, that have been targets of PRC coercive action between just 2020 and 2022. The larger the red circle on there, um, that's more cases that have affected that country. So I'll go through a few specific case studies in a minute, but from this range of, again, over 19 countries, the pattern that emerges is that very few developing states have been publicly targeted and the PRC has not employed significant economically coercive tactics against the United States directly, usually preferring to lever, le levy pressure campaigns against individual companies in the United States instead of uh, nationally targeted actions. So kind of going chronologically here through a few case studies, and I'll, I'll try to keep each of these brief because there's a lot of just details on here already. Um, the first case I'll touch on here is that of Norway, which in 2010, the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, uh, independent of the Norwegian government, awarded the imprisoned Chinese dissident Liu Xiaobo the Nobel Peace Prize. The Chinese government in response declared that by openly supporting the extremely erroneous decision by the Nobel Committee, the Norwegian government has destroyed the political foundation and environment for cooperation in bilateral relations. So the, Beijing then put uh, ongoing free trade agreement talks on hold, um, began applying new quarantine and inspec inspection regulations on imported Norwegian salmon, among uh, a few other measures. And over the course of the next six years, uh, the salmon restrictions reduced the share of China's salmon imports to, uh, from 94% to 2%. So de despite that kind of dramatic decrease in direct impact of China's actions, uh, sorry, direct imports, the actual impact of China's actions was more mixed. 
Norwegian salmon exporters largely circumvented these restrictions by selling their salmon uh, in China through third countries like Vietnam, making the economic impact pretty mixed. Norway did not apologize for uh, the decision and the normalization of relations of t uh, on the, the range of activities and the resumption of free trade talks um, took six years to occur. So this uh, case is surely very familiar to everybody here. Um, in July 2016, the US and the ROK proposed the installation of the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD, anti-missile system um, to counter threats from North Korea. The step was condemned by the PRC and protested before its installation and after, um, and triggered a range of coercive measures over the next few years. They included restricting cultural exports from the ROK, like movies, television, musical performances, um, warning Chinese citizens not to travel to Korea, ending the sale of tour packages, and encouraging other popular boycotts of Korean products. It also included a significant set of actions against Lotte Group for its role in the land slop to host the Thad Battery that resulted in the closure of 87 of 99 latte stores in China initially, and eventually all of the latte stores in China. However, the impact and result of this in achieving Beijing's objectives uh, is again decidedly mixed. While individual industries, and particularly latte group, um, suffered significantly during the period of tension, overall trade between the PRC and the ROK actually increased. And the Pakane administration uh, did agree to the three no's to help normalize relations, but um, the THAAD battery was uh, still installed and remains in place. And perhaps most enduring and uh, significant to PRC's long-term interests uh, is that China's actions resulted in the beginning of a severe and ongoing decline in Korean public opinion towards China. All right, moving through here, Australia, a um, little bit more recent. Um, the relations between Australia and China began to deteriorate in 2017 and kind of continued in a downward spiral through 2022. Um, first, Australia passed uh, legislation to crack down on foreign interference, primarily targeted uh, Chinese actions in Australian politics, and also banned Huawei and ZTE. Uh, from 5G telecommunication networks in China, so that was in 2017. And then in 2020, Canberra called for an independent inquiry into the origins of COVID-19, which triggered an additional round and a rather comprehensive set of coercive efforts from China. China imposed high tariffs on barley, put restrictions on the exports of Australian beef, wheat, wine, lobster, and coal and encourage citizens not to travel to Australia. Uh, as relations between the PRC and Australia uh, have begun to thaw in 2022 and now into 2023, uh, the prevailing assessment of the impact of China's actions in Australia is that Australia has weathered the economic punishment uh, fairly well and that China didn't really receive anything as a result. While a few specific industries in Australia struggled during this time, generally speaking, Australian companies were able to diversify to new markets, uh, which has provided them with a kind of more uh, established base of security going forward. Australia also made no concessions on the key issues that China was reacting to, and um, like Korea, both Australian policymakers and public opinion has hardened further against China. All right, lastly, a little bit more straightforward um, and most recent is the case of economic coercion against Lithuania in 2021 when uh, Lithuania and Taiwan announced that a Taiwanese representative office would open and really sparked condemnation from China and a warning of potential consequences. Both sides recalled their ambassadors and China began to restrict trade. Um, they canceled direct freight trains to Lithuania and deleted Lithuania from the list of countries of origin at Chinese customs, which effectively blocked trade. 
They also pressured multinational companies to cut ties with Lithuania or lose access to the Chinese market. Again, this fourth case, um, China didn't seem to have as much uh, direct effect in uh, the results of its efforts. The Taiwan Representative Office opened as planned and remains open. The direct economic impact was marginal uh, because there's all, was a low share uh, that China already had in Lithuania's market to begin with, very small. Um, and also raised issues for China with the broader EU, um, including uh, the EU's now fast tracking of an anti-coercion instrument that's meant to protect member countries from coercive behavior. So these four cases are only um, a small sampling of the broader set of incidences that countries have faced, um, but they raise a really important question for policymakers to grapple with. Um, you know, what, what actually is China seeking to achieve when it implements these tools of economic statecraft? First, um, I think it's important to examine how China has framed the use of economic coercion. When it comes to official statements, um, pronouncements on economic coercion, the PRC uh, primarily seeks to shift the narrative and to blame the United States, primarily the United States, but also other countries um, for levying unfair accusations, for smearing China's name, um, while also insisting that um, the United States is actually uh, the true perpetrator of coercion. So while the United States and other countries do utilize a tool, uh, a range of tools, uh, including economic sanctions against countries, um, these are typically accompanied by explanations publicly for um, that rationale behind the sanctions, including um, identifying the domestic or international law or legal issues at stake. In contrast, the PRC rarely makes formal acknowledgments of its coercive actions or identifies the legal basis for them. Uh, it's intentional. This intentional ambiguity allows China to deny any concerted or state-led efforts um, that might be occurring. And it also leaves open um, and unclear what the potential set of wrong actions a country could take that might incur uh, China's coercive measures, which uh, you know, has the effect of causing states to feel uncertain um, in whether a particular decision they might make would result in economic punishment from China. Uh, this opacity also means that Chinese motivations for the use of coercion are challenging to truly know. A few potential goals for coercive behavior might be um, to influence domestic actors like business so that they apply pressure on governments to take action. Um, this seemed to be the case in Australia where, uh, where China applied severe pressure to select industries and perhaps in the hopes that they would appeal to the Australian government to soften its approach to China. A second goal could be a course reversal um, to achieve uh, a, a return on the offending action or otherwise compel the state to formally apologize and make amends for the action. Um, a third potential goal would be to um, pressure the target country to take more pro-Beijing stances in the future uh, for fear of suffering another round of punishment. And then finally, um, economic coercion can be used to send a message to third party countries that they too could be subject to these same measures unless they align their actions with Chinese interests and avoid offending the PRC. So as we revisit um, some of the after effects and impacts that the case studies showed, um, we're faced again with this question that if China's coercive behavior is often ineffective in achieving uh, immediate and direct economic impacts or extracting, extracting concessions from targeted countries, why does it remain a core tactic of PRC statecraft? So I think um, kind of the fourth potential motivation on that previous slide, um, which to, is to scare off kind of the countries that are watching from the sidelines from taking similar action in the future, is a key outcome of China's coercive behavior. 
as it says here, nobody wants to be the next Korea, the next Lithuania or Australia and have to grapple with the suite of challenges that these countries faced as a result. Even if in the end, the, the countries weathered um, those course of actions fairly well. Uh, I think it's very important to understand um, the, or to try to determine the underlying uh, goal and role for economic coercion, um, because that has implications for how countries uh, who are seeking to combat economic coercion, to improve their resilience, um, and deter China from these behaviors, what, what steps they might take. Uh, states, especially, um, especially those middle and smaller powers with economic interdependence on China, um, in all of these cases are being pushed to make decisions that run counter to their national interest. And China's ability to shape the behavior of individual states as well as the larger multilateral groupings um, or bodies like uh, the EU uh, to reflect PRC interests really hinges on the credibility of and impact of this coercive power. So I think one of the key takeaways here is that the narratives that both China and other states formulate around the results of this economic coercion really matters. Um, as states emerge from periods of economic coercion of these challenging uh, uh, periods, focusing on uh, the limited impact that the economic coercion had on the economy and the methods that the state employed where applicable um, to weather the challenges from those economic impacts uh, focusing on those would help others see that there are options beyond just kind of caving or shaping uh, their behavior to Chinese preferences. Uh, the uh, other two are kind of interlinked, and that is that the more that states coordinate on best practices for deterring coercion and increasing economic resilience, the more challenging it is for China to utilize division to achieve its objectives. And we've started to see some momentum on this front, um, including with statements out of the G7 uh, summit just last month um, and efforts from the EU to kind of multilateralize and collect collectivize um, the solution or potential solutions to, uh, to this course of behavior. All right, and I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sarinsky has brought big picture and concrete cases related with Chinese economic coercion. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's move to second presentation. Professor Lee, please. Thank you very much. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sujan Lee, or Isuhan. Uh, I'm serving as a uh, assistant professor at S. Roger Atma School of Studies at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Uh, today, I'm going to have a, a presentation on ASEAN's response to the U.S.-China competition with a subtitle of the continuity and change. So. I have three research questions that I want to address in this research project, which I think you know, might have several implications you know, for Korea's response to the uh, increasing rivalry between the two great powers. So the first question is, how has the rivalry between the US and China unfolded in the Southeast Asia region? And secondly, how have the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, the well-known ASEAN, and its member countries been responding to the uh, growing tensions you know, between the two countries. And the uh, last question is, what are the you know, main characteristics or features of South Asian regional security strategies against this you know, great power competition? Uh, so I'd like to you know, uh, start by recapping uh, nuts and bolts of ASEAN. As everybody knows, ASEAN is an intergovernment organization of 10 Southeast Asian uh, countries. So it was established in 1967 in Bangkok, but it was started you know, with a, a relatively smaller group of countries, such as Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand. But uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, we, we see that uh, five countries uh, joined the organizations respectively. And Timor List, uh, or East Timor, you know, previously, they will be the 11th as a member state uh, as they have obtained 
the observer status uh, last fall, November 2022. So ASEAN has put a lot of emphasis uh, on its characteristics as a security community. Uh, first of all, it has put a great emphasis on the member countries' dependable expectations of a regional peace and then prosperity, but the, they do not want to rely on military force for dispute settlement. And then also, they are part of the security community, but each member state, they have a bit of different perceptions of an you know, external threat. Uh, with a common caution or even fear against communist insurgencies you know, during the Cold War era, which means that several countries, you know, they might have some concerns about the uh, rise of you know, China or even in Vietnam for ideological reasons. Uh, and economically, all of these countries, interestingly, they embraced the one common concept, economic pragmatism, because they see economic prosperity and then pragmatism as a, a one way to dissolve historical antagonism, uh, I mean, because while they're pursuing this in a common good, they believe in you know, regional stability will follow. Um, so this is the reason why the ASEAN countries you know, uh, uh, has uh, emphasized the importance of a regional economic cooperation and integration, which is closely linked multilateralism and the rules-based international order. So as I will be detailed later, they have put a lot of effort and the resources in building multiple layers of you know, regional institutions. So I'd like to start uh, by you know, how we should perceive ASEAN security strategies. And then you know, one common uh, uh, idea you know, that was suggested in the literature is that the existing uh, dominant paradigms, such as in the realism or in the liberalism, regardless of the version, it will offer only partial and limited explanations for a sense security strategies or their preferences. So there are several reasons you know, for that. Uh, one of them is ASEAN centrality and neutrality in building the regional security architecture. And then secondly, uh, when uh, pursuing economic and then political cooperation, uh, these member countries, you know, uh, try to maintain the so-called ASEAN way, which frequently relies on informality rather than formality, consensus building, non-interference, non-confrontation, and the non-legalistic method. So you, you might see this, you know, presentation of ASEAN way. Um, in ASEAN's response you know, for the recent crisis in Myanmar, for instance. And then at the same time, they uh, sought to build ties and strengthen those ties with major powers, including both the US, China, European Union, in various forms, bilaterally, multilaterally, but they will never take side. So ASEAN states you know, have been continuously you know, unwilling, or you know, they are, are reluctant to go with clear options such as in balancing against or in the bandwagoning with a single power. Uh, it is, you know, quite rational strategy because given the uh, size and the power of ASEAN member countries, going with in the straightforward options and it can be very costly, politically and economically. Uh, so when we characterize the Southeast Asian countries in response to the rising competition between the US and China, or the corresponding change in power distribution in the ASEAN Pacific region, I like to emphasize that there are three dimensions we might wanna look at. The first one is ASEAN's hedging strategies against the military or economic rise of China. And secondly, ASEAN's institutionalization of the regionalism and the multilateralism. And the last one will be how the recent development uh, of the tensions between the US and China have affected you know, these two issues I just suggested. So first of all, you know, let me briefly remind you, you know, the meaning of the hedging uh, is related to the reason why you know, we are trying to you know, uh, move away from the traditional realism or liberalism. Hedging refers to a set of cooperative and confrontational strategies adopted when countries cannot decide on 
which option you know should be chosen uh, such as in balancing bandwagoning or neutrality and then ASEAN countries and you know, they're trying to cultivate a middle point uh, uh, option uh, in that way they're trying to avoid in you know, the choosing side or to prepare for uncertainty or contingencies so ASEAN's hedging it has focused on mainly the rise of China which generate you know, high stakes and high uncertainty situations you know, rather than the United States itself. So while you know, not taking sides uh, or you know, not fully aligning one's uh, uh, interest with a, a single big power, ASEAN countries you know, have tried to implement a set of contradictory and then counteracting measures politically, economically, uh, as a way to uh, pursue gains and at the same time fallback options. So this is the reason why ASEAN's security uh, strategy hedging should be distinguished you know, from this simple neutrality or non-alignment. So the examples of ASEAN's hedging strategies you know, during the great power competition over the past years, uh, here you know, I'm citing the quick uh, uh, study, and then it has two different goals. You know, one is return maximizing. So they're pursuing economic pragmatism, and then try to build a binding engagement with both the United States and China, multilaterally, bilaterally, as mentioned earlier, and then they also go with uh, somehow limited bandwagoning, sort of collaboration, but only for a selective you know, key issues, but that they never go into a subordination. The other important part of the hedging will be risk contingency. So, so I'll try to build a, uh, a framework for return maximizing. They're also trying to diversify those channels, especially in trade and investment. And then in that way, they're trying to minimize the geopolitical risk, not using the military options, and then also balancing to minimize the secret risk uh, by having defense partnership or by enhancing each country's own military options, but that they do not make any clear target for that. Um, there are so, you know, some common fears or you know, concerns about the rise of China or China's assertiveness. But the, they also see a lot of chances you know, from the economic rise of China. So that's the reason why many ASEAN countries you know, have built uh, partnerships or institutional framework. Uh, and then the, another part uh, of the ASEAN's hedging strategy is that it clearly reflects ASEAN state uh, strategic security preferences. So ASEAN's hedging strategy, this is not uh, just as in a residual options, uh, such as in balancing bandwagoning or neutrality, but uh, it, it's more about you know, their active efforts uh, to maintain the pre-existing hierarchical power distribution or imbalance that, that slightly favors the overall preponderance of the United States. So they clearly embrace you know, China as a, a new regional power, but according to Evelyn Go, she, she says that but the ASEAN states try to have a China right below the tier of the United States in military terms. So again, Despite you know, their concerns and fears of China, ASEAN states, you know, they never addressed in a pure, direct balance against China, and they always go with indirect and the subtle options. And then, except for the uh, Philippines and Singapore, uh, none of the ASEAN states, you know, they have no formal military, military alliances with the United States, but they uh, have that option if they want. Uh, so the expansion of the ASEAN states in a defense partnership with the United States, um, it is mainly to increase hedging options, as in um, Vietnam and then Singapore. Uh, the second part I'd like to emphasize is ASEAN's commitment and initiative in institutional building. So military, uh, uh, in the military terms, in ASEAN's original forum, in short, ARF, started in 1993, 
it uh, tries to uh, enhance that sense of engagement with many big powers, including China, India, Japan, Russia, the United States, and the European Union. So this is a, a one important regional security dialogue for ASEAN. And then with East Asian countries, ASEAN also has ASEAN plus three, in short, APT, since 1997. And then it tries to promote cooperation between 10 ASEAN countries, and then China, Japan, uh, South Korea, but the more for economic goals, uh, including trade, investment, finance, and energy. And then it is also closely linked to their plans to build ASEAN community uh, vision in 2025. Uh, in terms of institutional building, the, uh, uh, the area we need to look at is ASEAN plus one free trade agreement, which means ASEAN's uh, free trade agreement with its dialogue partners. So ASEAN started with ASEAN free trade area in 1992. If you look at the record, you know, the level of liberalization and openness was pretty superficial on the day. But uh, since 2004, ASEAN began to build FDA um, with China, Japan, Korea, India, and more recently, Australia and the New Zealand. And then the level of the depths of the economic integration or you know, a trade liberalization or the scope of the area covered by each agreement has expanded you know, significantly. Uh, two other representative examples will be mega trade, uh, free trade agreement. One is comprehensive, progressive, you know, agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, in short, the CPTPP. Um, you might remember the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which was uh, criticized by uh, U.S. former tr uh, President, you know, Donald Trump. You know, right after you know getting to power, he pulled the U.S. you know uh, from the TPP. Uh, the TPP. But uh, if you look at the uh, CPTPP actually started you know, with a uh, small uh, uh, agreement between the Brunei, Chile, New Zealand, Singapore, which entered into force in 2006. And then as the Obama administration uh, began to emphasize to the uh, people to Asia strategy, um, this TPSP is extended again as TPP, which later became the CPTPP. And then now this blog accounts for a certain point in the five percentage of the global economy and then connect all the uh, ASEAN member countries, including Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam, with seven other countries in the Asia Pacific. Uh, the last one is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, in short, DARSA, uh, which entered into force in 2022. This is the, currently the largest trade bloc that accounts for 30% of the global economy and the world population. It includes all ASEAN states and five other countries, including the US, China, Japan, and Korea and India. And ASEAN itself sees the RCEP as its own triumph uh, you know, for the uh, middle power diplomacy. So if you look at the uh, CPTPP and RCEP, we can observe you know, the ways in which ASEAN tries to build the relations with the major powers. All of these in agreements often include at least in the US or China, or both of them simultaneously. In that way, you know, they're trying to diversify their military and their economic options. Uh, so, summarize. Currently, uh, in response to the rising uh, tensions between the U.S. and China over the so-called in a great power competition. ASEAN's security uh, shows its own continuity. You know, since the Cold War era, it has developed many options you know, for hedging and then soft balancing, especially in response to you know, China's assertiveness. At the same time, they have you know, really clear goals for regional prosperity and then economic cooperation. So this is the reason why you know, they built in um, multiple layers of institutions, uh, which is you know, characterized uh, as the uh, broader multi-directional or even in omni enmeshment in you know, your strategy. And then all of these strategies you know, typically includes 
great powers, such as the US and China, but uh, they are very uh, active in building relations with Korea, Japan, India, Australia, and New Zealand. So ASEAN's you know, recommitment to the ASEAN community, um, such as ASEAN political security community, ASEAN economic community, ASEAN sociocultural community, you might be surprised to see that, you know, this organization, intergovernment organizations, has published a lot of uh, uh, resources and materials about how ASEAN has uh, uh, evolved as a uh, regional organization. Uh, so they have clear goals um, to build a, a single market production base with new mechanisms strengthening ASEAN's economic initiatives and then accelerating regional integration. Of course, you know, liberalization will bring in domestic tensions or in you know, conflicts. So there are some differences across in the countries in dealing with its uh, uh, goal. But ASEAN as a whole, they have been doing a pretty impressive job. So I'd like to end my presentation by reconsidering uh, a couple of you know, remaining questions. So the so-called in you know, a heading strategy and then institutional building, I, I just mentioned that those are the uh, two main features of ASEAN's security strategy in response to the great power competition. Um, but we might need to ask, how long will ASEAN's in you know, a hedging and institutional building be effective in mitigating or in you know, moderating this uncertainties and risk that mainly come from the rivalry between the United States and China. Uh, and then now, ASEAN countries, I think you know, they have some concerns and you know, fears about what is happening between the two great powers. But some see that you know, ASEAN countries or you know, the uh, Asia Pacific region might emerge as a uh, new arena for the uh, competition between these uh, two great powers because um, earlier this month, you know, June 2nd, in 2023, there was a you know, Shangri-La Dialogue, which is a uh, track one international intergovernment you know, security uh, conference. And then during that event, it was in you know, a very clear that the U.S. and China tried to buy support for each ASEAN member countries. Uh, but simultaneously, ASEAN member countries, you know, they also have different perceptions about what China has said or what the United States ha has said. So within the ASEAN, we see that there is a, a new division in their views of you know, perceptions or you know, threats. Uh, so the continuing change in the power configuration is you know, worthy of uh, further investigation. So recently, the Louis Institute published Asia Power Index uh, and then compared you know, the records in 2018 and 2022. And then it shows that China's uh, influence on South, Southeast Asia region, it is you know, more influential than the US in almost all area, except for military uh, uh, sphere. So economically, diplomatically, China uh, has in a growing power over the ASEAN state. And then the United States, uh, as comparison, you know, its influence within Southeast Asia states has waned, obviously, over the past five years. Interestingly, but the US still has a uh, great advantage in military terms um, by building different network in many countries, especially with the Philippines, Thailand, and Singapore which also reflect, you know, these countries' strategic preferences and goals. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to stop here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Lee helped us, helped us to differentiate the ASEAN way from the general uh, economic, general uh, uh, hedging strategy. And thank you. And uh, let's move to Professor Lee. Another Lee. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhou. Uh, my name is Wang Wili. I'm a professor of Azu University. <coughs> uh, my topic is uh, Korea in the uh, uh, United States uh, China strategic competition. Actually, my focus is on the economic security dilemma. But uh, 
IR scholars are very familiar with I mean, the concept of a, a security dilemma uh, coined by the John Hurt uh, more than 70 years ago. Uh, that's why uh, uh, borrow the concept, I mean, to explain the dilemma or kind of paradox uh, Korea face now. Uh, you can see uh, economic uh, security dilemma can be defined as a situation in which strategies pursued by a state to enhance its own economic security provoke counter strategies from the other states, which in turn lead to a reduction rather than a growth in the original states. Uh, economic security. As you can see, uh, this is a, a kind of paradoxical irony. Yeah? Uh, uh, as I said, uh, Korea has a very serious uh, economic security dilemma. As you know well, uh, Korea is an open economy with a high trade dependence. But uh, since the, uh, the out outbreak of the uh, trade war in uh, 2018, a combination of China's economic retaliation after the SAD deployment in 2017, Japan's export control in 2019, and the America's French shoring pressure since 2021 has substantially eroded its economic security. I think the Yun administration has made a very good effort, I mean, to uh, improve uh, economic security. Actually, uh, the administration, the administration uh, uh, set a key foreign uh, 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 policy uh, priority, I mean, to economic security and create a secretary for economic security uh, in the presidential office. But uh, I'm afraid, I mean, that it's uh, very hard, I mean, to say now its economic security has remarkably improved. I think that the Korea's uh, dilemma uh, comes from the uh, economy, security, technology nexus. Actually, Korea is a, a highly dependent on China for its uh, economy and trade or, or commerce. At the same time, the Korea is a highly dependent on the United States for its security and technology. But we know that uh, the, during the Cold War, the nexus uh, was very loose and uh, in, uh, we can, I mean, insert uh, rate, I mean, uh, itself from the fluctuation of the US-China relations. But the uh, event of the new Cold War has tightened the nexus and we cannot I mean, insulate our, uh, ourselves from the, uh, the strategic competition. And nowadays, I mean, the Korea is forced to take aside China or America. I think that uh, if the coupling between the United States and China is uh, realized, its economic security would be in a severe uh, trouble. But, yeah. Uh, we know that uh, Korea is not the only uh, one country facing the uh, dilemma. Japan, Germany, Australia, and Taiwan has the also very uh, 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 similar problems. All of them ha uh, have a strong military ties with the United States, at the same time with a high trade dependence on China. But I think th uh, that what makes the Korea unique is that the main export of the uh, industries, uh, that is, uh, semiconductor and batteries are uh, uh, extremely vulnerable to the uh, economic coercion, such as export control, investment screen, uh, restriction of technology transfer, and the likes. Okay, uh, let me show you some uh, uh, details on the uh, Korea's situation. This graph, I mean, just to show that uh, uh, Korea's place, uh, I mean, uh, in the global supply chains. Uh, you can see the, in the global supply chains, uh, Korea is uh, separate from the United States, but quite closely, I mean, linked to China. But then, uh, Uh, 
yes. Uh, thanks to the, I mean, the previous uh, presentations, uh, we all know that well about the China's economic coercion. But uh, it's not well known. I mean, the outside uh, Korea, the, the case, case of, I mean, uh, rare solutions. That is why uh, I like to uh, highlight, I mean, the case, although it's not a typical case, uh, typical uh, case of economic coercion, but real uh, solution problems started from the uh, October 2021. At that time, uh, China introduced some export control, but actually it's not targeted at the South uh, Korea, but uh, South Korea imported 97% of rare solutions from China. And uh, that's why Korea uh, became the biggest uh, victim, actually unexpected, I mean, uh, victim of uh, China's export control. But fortunately, I mean, uh, by responding to Korea's uh, request, China allowed some Chinese producers, I mean, to export, uh, re-export, I mean, uh, rare solution to uh, Korea. But it's, it's, it's a happy ending, but <laughs> uh, this is a, actually what a shadow moment, I mean, that the Korea uh, can understand how yeah, the country is vulnerable for the uh, supply chain uh, disruption uh, by uh, China. Uh, the other example is uh, uh, Japan's economic caution. But you might wonder why Japan, yeah? But actually, Japan is not a bystander, I mean, in terms of economic sanctions. Uh, Japanese government is quite active in yeah, imposing a sanction uh, against China, and uh, Russia and nowadays. Anyway, uh, in July uh, 2019, the Japanese government unilaterally announced a change of licensing policies and procedures on export and transfer of control item and uh, their relative technologies to South Korea. Uh, three uh, months later, the Korean government filed a complaint, filed a complaint to uh, to the uh, WTO, arguing that Japanese export control abused the trade for political uh, purposes. Fortunately, I mean, uh, unlike the uh, China's retaliation against the Saudi deployment, Japan's export control yeah, come to an end uh, quite uh, uh, recently. The UN government made a move to improve the, uh, its bilateral economic and development diplomatic relations with uh, Japan by withdrawing the WTO complaint. In response, the Kishida cabinet uh, recently agreed to lift the uh, control. And yeah, it's a happy ending, yeah, mm. as you know. The final case is uh, uh, the United States economic caution. Yeah, you might be surprised because uh, yeah, <laughs> I call the, the United uh, policy as an uh, 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 economic caution. But uh, I found a very interesting report, I mean, published by CNAS in 2020. It's uh, uh, about the America's coercive uh, statecraft. This is why I can uh, 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 use, I mean, uh, uh, economic caution. I mean, uh, I, I can apply, I mean, the, the U.S. case is an is, is a, uh, economic caution. Anyway, uh, there are two cases. The first one is a uh, Chifo. Uh, Chifo is quite uh, well known, and I, I like to, I mean, skip uh, this case. But Micron is a, a very recent, I mean, uh, incident. Just after China banned the Micron chips from its key infrastructure project in uh, the last month, but it's, it's, it's a very unusual for U.S. Congress sent a very unusual message to South Korea government that its firm should not uh, backfill any roast production by Micron. Actually, I ha have never seen uh, uh, this kind of yeah, letter in my life. This is very unusual because the American government, I mean, sent uh, pressure to the Korean government like this. Anyway, but yeah, the Korean, I mean, semiconductor industries uh, hit by uh, uh, U.S. and the China sanction and its export to uh, China uh, uh, declined, especially in uh, uh, 2019, and uh, slightly, I mean, recover from the damage, but still, on under the uh, the uh, pre-crisis uh, uh, period. 
but Taiwan, America, Japan uh, steadily increased uh, its uh, semiconductor export to China. This is why uh, Korea is very angry about this kind of uh, yeah, pressures. Uh, the strategy Korea has uh, pursued nowadays is a kind of yeah, political risk hedging. I think the Professor Yi Su Hyun explained about uh, the explained the, the concept about hedging. But the main problem is the external oh no sorry yeah, extra uh, territorial application of sanction by the United States and China. I mean. This uh, kind of sanctions disrupted uh, Korea's supply chains. Actually, uh, in the previous decade, many Korean conglomerates built a production facility in China because China is the, our uh, uh, largest uh, exporting market. But nowadays, yeah, the, the Korean company I'm mean, lost to America. Why? Yeah, America uh, imposed a sanction and yeah, push, it, uh, push it ahead with a uh, French shoring policy. This is why several Korean companies uh, are constructing manufacturing plants uh, all over the, uh, America. But yeah, uh, in terms of uh, uh, politics or diplomacy, supply chain fragmentation is uh, 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 a uh, good choice because it's a kind of uh, hedging against the geopolitical risk. However, in terms of economics, yeah, the fragmentation is, uh, 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 is likely to I mean, increase cost and uh, reduce uh, efficiency. And it's a, a bad choice, I think. And we can see some kind of yeah, uh, trade diversion as a result of geopolitical political risk hedging. Actually, the Korea's uh, supply chain is uh, split uh, between the United States and uh, China. As a result, uh, the trade with China is declining. On the other hand, the yeah, trade with America yeah, is increasing. I think that this uh, trend is likely to continue as Korea's investment in the United uh, uh, States. Actually, the uh, Korean headquarters and uh, uh, American uh, branches uh, uh, promote a kind of intra-firm uh, trade and yeah, And uh, uh, trade deficit is an unexpected consequences of uh, trade diversion. Actually, uh, Korea has a ex ex experiencing uh, a large number of trade deficit has, uh, since the early uh, 2020. Because its export to China was the main source of Korea's trade surplus over the past three decades. The reduction of export to China gives a rise to a reduction in trade surpluses and foreign exchange reserves. I think that uh, without finding an alternative to the Chinese market, I think trade deficit could slow economic growth and increase the risk of the currency crisis uh, in the future. This is uh, many economists regard, I mean, the major economic security threat the Korea has to deal with in coming years. Okay, let me show you some details on the uh, Korea's trade deficit and uh, uh, balances. Okay, uh, yes. Uh, trade deficit, you, you can see, is uh, still yeah, is learning. But uh, let me emphasize that uh, this is the first time in 25 years since the January uh, 1995 to uh, May, uh, January 1997. 
You can remember that uh, 1997, the Korea uh, was hit by a, a, a currency crisis. Nowadays, we call it the, the East Asia uh, financial crisis. And yeah, China's, I mean, uh, uh, trade surplus is very important. I mean, uh, from a perspective of Korea, you can see that uh, from the 1993 to uh, 2021, China accounted for 22.5 percent of total export and 16.9 uh, percent of total export, but it uh, constitute 86.0% uh, of overall trade surplus. That means that China's uh, surplus is overwhelmed the yeah, all uh, trade surplus uh, during the period. And yeah, uh, I, I uh, previously explained the, the recent I mean, trend of uh, uh, Korea's trade uh, with China and, and the United States. As you can see, the, since the early 2022, uh, China's share of export has fallen, whereas uh, America's has risen. I think the main driver of the reversal is the Korea's investment in the United States. We increase in intra-form trade between the Korean headquarters and the U.S. factories. But in terms of export, the share of China's remain twice as large as America's. Yeah, we can see that the, the similar I mean, trend I mean, uh, in terms of investment in China and the United States. Actually, uh, FDI in the United States, States uh, nearly doubled in the value year over the year in uh, 2021 and they continued uh, in uh, 2022. Uh, but uh, investment in uh, China uh, followed by less than a one half of the number between 2017 and 2020, but uh, doubling values. Okay, let me uh, uh, wrap up uh, my presentation. Uh, Korea is, had made an effort, I mean, to enhance uh, its economic security by di uh, diversifying trade, implementing uh, industrial policy, and uh, strengthening with uh, rings uh, with like-minded countries. But its trade uh, balance uh, turned from uh, surplus to deficit because of China, it's the largest trading partner and source of uh, trade surplus, reduce import uh, from the country. Uh, and it's a key industries, uh, I mean, including uh, semiconductor and uh, EV batteries, uh, face a danger of hollowing out manufacturing by investing massively in the United States. Unless uh, the strategic tension in the Sino-US relations is, I think, the uh, dilemma is likely, likely to get worse in near future. Yeah, let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Lee's presentation reminds us Northeast Asia is the next place. It is full of risk and full of economic coercion. So, uh, well, we have to face the hard reality. Okay, thank you. It seems each presentation has a designate uh, discussant Discussions focus on the presentation where you are designated. However, you are free to comment on or comment or raise uh, any point to any question, uh, any uh, presentation. So let's start with uh, Professor Kang Su Jung. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Su Jung Kang, and I'm an assistant professor of the Department of Political Science and Diplomacy at. Joseon University and a researcher uh, specialized in Chinese politics and diplomacy. Um, I'm sincerely grateful to organizers for inviting me to this conference panel. And I've been asked to give comments and questions on Dr. Alison Sawinski's presentation. 
first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Alison Sawinski for the interesting print presentation on assessing China's strategy of economic coercion and for sharing some very uh, valuable ideas related to such an emerging topic. How to um, assess China's strategy of economic coercion is an important but very difficult question we need to answer in uh, designing our effective counter strategies to respond to it. Uh, although China was traditionally an opponent of economic sanctions, but for now it has been deploying uh, coercive economic practices within a growing intensity and scope, particularly since the, the appointment of Xi Jinping as the country's president in 2018. And I think in order to make a more complete and balanced assessment on China's strategy of economic coercion, we need to consider several important aspects as follows. First of all, we need to think about why China's use of economic coercion is viewed as prob uh, problematic. Both the United States and China employ uh, instruments of economic statecraft in a coercive ways to achieve desired strategic outcomes, and both have increased their uh, employment of economic coercion in recent years. Uh, consistent with the deepening geoeconomic competition between the two great powers in the international system. Uh, many U.S. think tanks argue that there are important distinctions between when, how, and why the two great powers engage in e uh, economic coercion. But on the other hand, a common Chinese narrative is that the West uses accusations of coercive diplomacy to slander China. So I think um, a comparative and contrast analysis on the similarities and differences between China and other major powers who employ economic coercion in pursuit of their political goals will allow us to uh, better identify and illuminate the characteristics of China's economic coercion and to make a more balanced assessment of China's strategy of economic coercion. Uh, from this as, uh, aspect, I'd like to ask to Dr. Allison Salwinski, what do you think are the important uh, distinctions between the United States and China's Chinese approaches to economic coercion, and what makes China's use of economic coercion more pro problem problematic? Uh, another important thing we need to consider is the characteristics of China's economic coercion. From my perspective, um, a uh, distinct uh, characteristic of Chinese economic coercion is its informality. Although China has, in recent years, begun to develop more formal uh, coercive tools, Beijing still ha has uh, demonstrated a preference for uh, exercising its economic coercion through uh, informal channels. China rarely acknowledges the deployment of coercive measures or the link between them and the, uh, the country's perceived interest. Consequently, its economic coercion is uh, frequently carried out through uh, plausibly deniable means, such as the selective enforcement of regulations by customs officials, informal notices to commercial actors encouraging them to undertake particular course of action, tourism, adversaries, state-promoted boycott of foreign uh, corporations, and so on. So, so an important, uh, an impo informal approach to economic uh, coercion carries several advantages. It allows China to take rapid action while retaining an uh, element of ambiguity in, in its methods and intentions. And, and the plausible deniable, uh, deniability afforded by informal measures also allow China to avoid legal challenges and mitigate uh, diplomatic costs and quickly recalibrate and terminate uh, its, uh, its measures when its course measures prove 
uh, ineffective or too costly. But the most important thing we need to consider is that such an informality uh, complicates the, the response of the targeted state because it can be difficult in legal terms to distinguish uh, state-sanctioned informal coercion from market forces and legitimate, uh, legitimate uh, policy uh, concerns. This, uh, uh, this frustrates the targeted states that seek uh, recourse through the WTO's dispute settlement mechanism. This makes the task of challenging these practices in forums such as the WTO very difficult or simply impossible. So its uh, former nature may undermine the effectiveness and justifications of the targeted state's multilateral response to China's economic coercion. Despite the benefits, uh, informality also has its disadvantages. The informal nature of Chinese economic coercion can make Chinese, um, Chinese economic coercion less effective by complicating signaling. Coercion is uh, mostly effective when demands are clearly linked to uh, reasonable and limited goals. However, if China uh, explicitly ties its coercion to a trigger, this could undermine its plausible uh, deniability. The informality of Chinese coercion also seems to complicate its deterrent effect because China is unable to say explicitly what the punishment will be for a challenge to its core interest. So I think such uh, characteristics of Chinese economic coercion not only affect the effectiveness and outcomes of Chinese economic coercion, but also the counter strategies the target states uh, take or may take. From this perspective, I'd like to ask to Dr. Ellison Solonsky, what do you think are the important features of China's economic coercion we need to consider in assessing the effectiveness of China's economic coercion as well as in designing our countermeasures to respond to it? The last but the most important aspect I need, uh, I want to discuss is, that, is how to evaluate the outcomes of China's economic coercion. The dominant approach to evaluate, uh, evaluating outcomes of Chinese uh, economic coercion traditionally centered on the sender's ability to achieve uh, stated goals. So the effectiveness of economic coercion is an important part of assessment of China's strategy of economic coercion. However, it is difficult to measure the effectiveness of Chinese coercion. Some think tanks argue, based on their own case studies, that the most salient characteristic of Chinese economic coercion is that it's simply uh, not very effective. Granted that there is likely a deterrent effect on third parties, China's economic coercion nevertheless has a poor track uh, record of achieving its immediate policy aims. And when it does, it often carries long-term costs for China. According to the literature on economic sanctions, the effectiveness of a coercive economic measures weakens after implementation as alternative markets are found, costs rise over time, political coal uh, coalitions within the sending state uh, fracture, and views of sending state harden within their target state. From this perspective, I'd like to ask Dr. Allison Sawinski, what do you think are the important uh, factors affect, uh, affect the effectiveness and outcomes of China's economic coercion? In addition, we need to consider unintended indirect outcomes of Chinese economic coercion as well when evaluating it. Uh, I'd like to ask what uh, unintended and indirect outcomes of Chinese economic coercion you think may contribute to or can uh, cut against China's ability to achieve its desired concession. I think unintended and indirect outcomes of economic coercion need to receive more uh, attention in 
rapid uh, expanding line of research which investigate how economic coercion affect targeted states on a range of uh, dimensions. And that's all I wanted to discuss today and hope further discussions help us to make a more complete and balanced assessment of China's strategy of economic coercion. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you. Your reason you help us clarify the, some distinctive feature of the, uh, the economic coercion. Thank you. And let's move to uh, Dean Brandon Howe. Thank you very much, Professor Cho. Uh, my name is Brendan Howe. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of International Studies here at Ewa Women's University. I'm also the President of the Asian Political and International Studies Association. So I do encourage everyone to, to check out EPISA as well for future conferences. Uh, I enjoyed very much reading Professor Lee's paper on uh, ASEAN's response to the US-China competition continuity and change, because this is a, an area where I'm currently involved in research myself. Much of my research is on traditional security, but also non-traditional and human security cooperation in Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia, and collectively as East Asia. So very closely uh, focused on, on the sort of topics that are covered in this presentation. The key points I found from the presentation were, first, how has the rivalry between the United States and China unfolded in Southeast Asia? How, have, uh, how has ASEAN and its member states been responding to the growing tensions? What are the main characteristics of Southeast Asian regional security strategies uh, against great power competition? Uh, there's a comprehensive overview on the unique nature of the ASEAN way, including informality, consensus building, non-interference, non-confrontation, and I think perhaps most importantly, not taking sides. Indeed, this was emphasized in the PowerPoint presentation uh, and in Professor Lee's words. Uh, and I think that's also really the, the key dilemma that we're faced in East Asian, including Northeast and Southeast Asian security cooperation. How do we avoid taking sides in an era of great power competition. Another major element was the, the focus on economic pragmatism. And in this region, it's been uh, identified as a conophoria, where you try to solve all domestic and international governance challenges through economic development and interdependence. Professor Lee uh, also pointed to the, the regionalism and multilateralism focus of ASEAN. And these are areas that, that I'd like to address in quite a bit of detail, actually, in my response. Uh, the the rules-based international order, it depends which set of international rules you're focusing on. Uh, if we're looking at the, the non-intervention aspect of the in rules-based international order, then yes, ASEAN is, is very much on board with that. Uh, and indeed, China would be on board with non-intervention. If we're looking at some of the, the liberal rules-based international order championed by the United States, we still have competition uh, and coercion from US and China trying to force people to take sides. So the, the theoretical framework addressed by Professor Lee talks about ASEAN's hedging strategies against the rise of China, ASEAN's institutionalization of regionalism and multilateralism, and the impact of US-China competition on these two elements. And, and I think these also apply to the other presentations we had as well, that uh, again and again, we're looking at how can we hedge, how can we avoid taking sides between the great powers when both the great powers are trying to force everyone to do so. Professor Lee did mention realism and liberalism, but I was surprised that given the identity and community-driven nature of ASEAN, uh, she made no reference to English school rationalism, of which ASEAN is seen as the paradigmatic example, or social constructivism. Furthermore, uh, I think that an area where this could usefully be moved on in terms of discussion is the, the global challenges facing multilateralism. 
especially the maxilateral versions of multilateralism, where you try to be as inclusive as possible and have as, as many countries join your international organization as possible. That in an era of strategic competition among great powers, maxilateralism and indeed all forms of multilateralism have come under a great deal of threat. In response to this, we have seen a, a rise in the importance of regional multilateralism. Of course, ASEAN is the prime example of this. But also, very importantly, I think, the rise of minilateralism, especially in this area, and especially in terms of discussions about security. So what is meant by minilateralism? Well, it's a, a smarter, more targeted approach, bringing to the table the smallest possible number of countries needed to have the largest possible impact on solving a particular problem. And as I say, it's, it's experienced tremendous growth in theory and in practice uh, due to the global and regional contestations, and especially in the Indo-Pacific region. Of course, the terminology Indo-Pacific is also contested because it's seen as siding with the United States, whereas China prefers Asia-Pacific. Minilaterals are, are usually the, the golden number is three to five countries. Security provision is the common theme amongst most scholars and proponents of minilateralism. So current minilateralism is primarily concerned with the analysis of the strategic operating of security institutions containing between three and five actors, usually led by the United States, on occasion by another great power such as China, with other powers in supporting roles. They're playing the, the posse to the great power's sheriff. So good examples of this, AUKUS, or the Quad, in particular the Quad. This poses an additional challenge to ASEAN in the contemporary regional security order. In fact, there are several related problems here. The first problem is that rather than multilateral public values, uh, minilaterals are usually security focused and dominated by great powers. Indeed, there are lingering concerns that the minilateral partnerships are not designed to serve the interests of the states in the region. They're just designed to serve the large power interests. Nor are they designed to serve any collective security or regional systemic security function. The second problem is these frameworks are largely a Western construct that attempt to fill the expectation and capability gaps in the regional security system. So there's a possibility they'll impose the kind of neo-colonialism that ASEAN strives against. A third related challenge to the efficacy of minilateralism is that those that have been championed by the US and indeed which are the most prominent in the security field are seen as being constructed primarily to contain a rise in China rather than to resolve regional governance issues or generate public value. And this in turn of course, is problematic. First, China will, of course, and is indeed pushing back against these attempts to undermine their strategic position. But also, there's the risk that competing iterations of minilateralism narrow the space available for small and middle powers, uh, and indeed for, for regional multilateral efforts, because they're forced into a, a with us or against us narrative when most countries, and indeed ASEAN, would rather not choose. They'd rather maintain strategic ambiguity. So the room for autonomous policy initiatives by either the small and medium powers of ASEAN, or indeed ASEAN itself, are severely curtailed by the rise of minilateralism. Forcing regional actors to choose undermines the coherence of regional international organization. We've seen this before. US dominance and international reactions to it destroyed the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. It also caused the collapse of the first version of the Quad, which was actually a, a lot more non-traditional security focus than the, the new version. Most regional actors would rather not be forced to choose 
but they are being forced to choose by this prominence of minilateralism. And this links to the, the final problematic area for, for regional security organization, that of its exclusionary rather than inclusive nature. To contribute meaningfully towards regional order building, minilateral initiatives need to generate support from regional constituencies, in particular from ASEAN. Yet the exclusionary nature of minilateralism undermines multilateral uh, platforms like ASEAN, generating resentment within the association and among its members. And this is especially so, as Professor Lee identified, because ASEAN's core values of uh, centrality and unity are in direct contradiction with the exclusivi exclusivity of minilateral institutions. Minilateral institutions threaten to replace the, the provision of international public goods with club goods, benefiting a narrow range of countries while marginalizing the, the formal international institutions of, of what we've seen as the rules-based international order. So unless they use very deftly and judiciously, minilateralism risks undermining the, the legitimacy and effectiveness of international organizations and even accelerating the world's coalescence, coalescence into rival coalitions. So, to a certain extent, I'd like to throw this back to Professor Lee and say, well, what can we do about it? I, I have a few suggestions, uh, but and I, I'd greatly appreciate your feedback on my suggestions. First of all, non-traditional security minilateralism. That if our objective is rather than hard security, if our objective is addressing some of the non-traditional human security challenges in the region, uh, it might be there's more freedom for operation for non-great powers. Indeed, I would advocate the leadership of non-traditional security minilateralism should come from second-tier powers, uh, and as far as I'm concerned, second-tier powers are those that have more capacity than middle powers but also a regional rather than maxilateral focus. Professor Lee did mention that, that ASEAN is trying to assimilate China into a second tier of powers, uh, but I, I don't think that China would be very happy being incorporated into a second tier of powers when it sees itself on a par with the United States as a great power. So the, the leadership and membership of these non-traditional minilaterals could come from these second tier powers and from ASEAN, or even just ASEAN members. Now, of course, ASEAN's already working with, with a number of other powers I, that I would consider to be either already second-tier powers or the capacity to become second-tier powers, and that includes Japan, South Korea, Australia, as Professor Lee points out. Other potential partners outside of the region would be Canada, the EU, and indeed some of the, the medium powers and even the small powers within the EU, that the important thing is that the leadership should not come from the great powers. Then they can't force us to choose. The leadership should come from the second tier of powers or the second tier of international institutions. So that, I think, is my time. So I'd love to hear Professor Lee's comments on that. Okay, thank you. Let's move to Dr. Young. Hi, uh, my name is Won Ho Yun. Uh, I'm an economist, uh, head of economic security team at uh, Korea Institute for International Economic Policy. Uh, my expertise is U.S.-China trade relations, uh, U.S.-China tech rivalry and economic security issues. Uh, currently, I advise, I advise um, National Security Office of Presidential Office and Minister of Foreign Affairs. So I'm more into a policy uh, arena but I'd like to uh, thank, uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, wonderful uh, seminar today. Uh, first, I'd like to comment on economic coercion. Um, so before, I mean, uh, I think it is effective to uh, respond to uh, China's maybe economic coercion collectively, but before thinking about collective response, uh, I think we should uh, think about how we define economic coercion. 
So, for example, um, we, it is about whether uh, we are going to include um, only unofficial measures or both uno unofficial and official measures. Also, uh, it is about whether we are going to include um, uh, maybe uh, illegal cases or both illegal and legal cases. Uh, why I am asking this question is uh, because when we see the Micron case, uh, uh, which uh, Professor Lee Wang Yi mentioned, uh, it's quite uh, interesting because um, U.S. is trying to say that um, China's sanction against Micron is economic coercion, but actually uh, China admit that uh, they did, and it's based on their domestic law. So usually, uh, like past measures that China used against uh, other nations, including Korea, Japan, Lithuania, Australia, uh, actually never been recognized by Chinese government and never uh, based on any laws. But Micron's case is quite unusual. And also then we can also ask about, uh, how about economic coercion within the dec democracies in our group? Uh, we experienced in 2019 with Japan, maybe uh, this year we are having the uh, same uh, situation with the US. So how are we going to treat this uh, within the group? So that's uh, kind of uh, questions I'd like to raise. And secondly, uh, regarding the um, restructuring of trade and investment networks, re restructuring, restructuring of supply chain issue, which is quite costly. Uh, so uh, IMF actually uh, re has a report this year and put it out that the cost of investment fragmentation could lower global output by as much as 1% uh, annually. And also warns that uh, trade and tech fragmentation could be even more damaging. So with all having this uh, fragmentation, it could lower up to 7% of global GDP. And moreover, IMF estimates that in some particular countries, output losses could be as high as 12%. It's a huge cost. And um, usually uh, most governments and um, private sectors, uh, they uh, cope with this issue in two ways. Uh, nearshoring and reshoring, I mean nearshoring and friendshoring. Um, and interestingly, uh, given that we are facing the em emerging development of uh, trade blocks uh, based on values, uh, probably the friendshoring is the better answer to uh, the current situation. And um, this year, another uh, research from Mitsubishi Research Institute uh, analyzed that the cost of uh, friendshoring uh, will increase the most uh, in Korea's case, which is uh, greater than I think uh, uh, Japan, uh, Japan's cost or the United States cost or even the US cost. So in that case, I think um, regarding the uh, de-risking, uh, our solution should be uh, diversification rather than uh, partial decoupling uh, based on values or uh, et cetera. Uh, so that's uh, related to probably um, uh, Pro Professor Li Wang Yi's uh, re research, but also uh, Professor Li Su Hyun's uh, research also. So when I heard today uh, about the Li Professor Li Su Hyun's uh, uh, presentation, uh, I think. Uh, ASEAN is, what ASEAN is trying to do is, um, as long as they can uh, preserve like ASEAN centrality, they can do anything. Like, I think their strategy is quite ambiguous. Uh, so it's based on informal, like uh, not based on legal. Uh, but what the current Korean government is trying to do is quite opposite to that. Like everything is official, like based, based on laws. We emphasize like principles. Uh, so that's quite interesting uh, to observe. So lastly, about the bottom line uh, here, if we all have to agree uh, on one particular rules, I think it should be like, uh, we should keep in mind that economic security is a condition for economic prosperity, uh, not a means to achieve economic pr prosperity. Let me stop here, thank you. Okay, thank you. So let's have time for presenters to respond to what our uh, discussions mentions. So let's start with, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Sa Sarinsky. Okay. Wonderful. 
Uh, first, I'd like to offer a sincere, very sincere thanks to Professor Kong Su Jung for um, some really well-structured and uh, thought-provoking comments and specific questions. Um, I think a lot of the elements that you raised, uh, some of the challenges in um, understanding the important factors um, and features within economic coercion um, are very important at getting at kind of the overarching question that I was really drawn to when I started uh, looking at and working on this presentation. Um, your, your first question uh, regarding uh, kind of a comparison and contrast of different um, countries' use of economic coercion, what the distinctions are, um, what makes one more problematic or another. I think this is um, a really interesting area for discussion. It was definitely outside the remit of what I was uh, focusing on here, um, but there's a lot of important elements, and I think actually um, your second set of um, comments kind of gets at and answers part of um, that question, which is um, the distinction between um, the informal uh, kind of uh, uh, intentionally ambiguous, undefined uh, types of economic coercion that I was showing in the examples um, and uh, what has been often touted from China as the US versions of economic coercion, which are more often um, explained at a national level or given more structure and definition, and for the most part based on um, kind of an illegal basis. Um, and the, the elements that you noted in terms of what makes um, informality appealing for China and then also some of the challenges that um, can make it somewhat less effective um, is also a very interesting um, point, and I thank you for raising it. Um, I think the challenges of uh, measuring the effectiveness of economic coercion um, is something that is very, uh, that a lot of scholars are trying to grapple with when they work on this topic is what exactly are um, we considering success? Um, what exactly are the factors and elements um, that we could look at to determine uh, whether or not what China is doing is achieving its goals and outcomes? And that's part of the reason I wanted to cover kind of what are some of the potential goals that China could have in order for us to understand whether it's having success or not. Um, but something that I think I didn't elucidate enough is, as you noted, there's a lot of studies right now that have indicated, you know, China is not very effective along a range of different measures. It's not been that effective in having a significant direct economic impact or an enduring impact. Um, it's not been successful in achieving reversal of behavior or um, changing the outcome of the action that was being protested. Um, but what I think um, is harder to measure, and this is what I was trying to get at, is its impact on those third countries um, because it's hard to measure non-action, right? That we don't really know in how many cases or um, in what specific ways countries are choosing not to take action or shaping their behavior differently based on um, what they have seen uh, China do in previous cases. Um, so in this case, I would actually argue without being able to measure it very concretely, that um, this is where China is a little bit more successful and it's why China continues to pursue these tactics because China is assessing that it's able to shape especially smaller country behaviors by taking these um, specific case-by-case -case actions against countries. Um, and there's perhaps a more robust range of anecdotal evidence um, where you have informal conversations um, with policymakers and leaders who um, will make statements referring to the challenges that their country faces in taking X, Y, and Z action because they don't want to provoke China or risk retaliation. Um, and so in that circumstance, that would be a case where China is seeing some success in its economic coercion by shaping the behaviors of other states. Um, and so I think that's something I would 
um, underscore more a little bit um, in terms of uh, factors of measuring effectiveness or whether or not China is achieving um, its outcomes, its intended effects. Um, I think I'll leave it there because I know I have several other pre presenters who want to respond to their um, their discussants, but again, I just want to thank uh, Professor Zhang so much for very thoughtful uh, remarks. Thank you, and Professor Lee. Okay, um, I very much appreciate uh, Professor Brendan House, you know, comment and suggestions on my work. So I think you know, there are a series of the key points, you know, uh, raised by uh, Dean Howe. So the first part is that, you know, the, despite the ASEAN's emphasis on the rules-based international order, uh, its characteristics you know, can be uh, conditional by you know, who dominate the platform. And then um, the, the first point you know, about the references you know, might be enhanced further with the consideration of the English school of internationalism or constru constructivism. Yeah, I, I think that it can be definitely done. So I, I like to thank you for that. Um, I clearly acknowledge the rising challenges of you know, multilateralism and then you know, the need to look into further uh, the possibility or feasibility of you know, minilateralism, uh, understanding the region's uh, changing security architecture. I think ASEAN states, you know, despite my earlier emphasis on their you know, common preferences of maintaining the pre-existing U.S. preponderance in the region, I, I also see that, as uh, Professor Howe suggested, we also see ASEAN member states have some doubt about the U.S. leadership. I, I think you know, they, they, uh, this kind of you know, discussion should be developed further. And as a member state, also see that there are some inadequacies or ineffectiveness of a you know, multilateral setting in dealing with a variety of you know, issues uh, that could be a you know, political, mili uh, military, or economic one. So the rise of multilateralism and its implications on ASEAN's uh, centrality or uh, ASEAN's you know, regional security architecture, I think you know, that will be a great uh, 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 way to develop this project further. Um, I, I have a couple of questions you know, regarding the, how to deal with you know, uh, minilateralism. Maybe I, I could uh, discuss with Professor Hoey later uh, in detail. Um, I think minilateralism, it has been preferred uh, at least by several ASEAN member countries, but the framework suggested by uh, Professor Hui, uh, such as three to five membership, and then you know, there should be no superpower. Maybe you know, ASEAN uh, countries can go with and other middle power countries. Um, that would be very ideal, but if you, if you look at you know the track records of ASEAN's minilateralism, I think you know, that is not what actually happening. So in the case of you know, in the Mekong area, there is a minilateral arrangement you know between China and the Laos and the Cambodia, and then ASEAN member states experience that there are certain costs that come from minilateralism. So Personally, even if you know, I see the ongoing challenges to multilateralism, um, maybe it might be too early to you know, suggest that multilateralism you know, might replace multilateralism in understanding ASEAN's security architecture. But yeah, obviously the, the rise of multilateralism and then its coexistence with multilateralism I think you know that should be uh, considered a more analytical way. So that I, I very much appreciate uh, Professor House's comment. And then I recall uh, Professor Yun or so uh, briefly uh, gave me a comment uh, about my topic, and I fully agree uh, with this point. Um, I think the reason why ASEAN's case is interesting that it is an interesting. Uh, 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 way of maintaining the hedging options. 
but uh, more recently, I see that ASEAN member states, you know, begin to have some doubt about, you know, how long this kind of, you know, centrality, neutrality, or, you know, housing options in economic area can be maintained further. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I like to develop the paper further uh, following the suggestions by Professor Harvey. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And Professor Yuangi. Uh, okay, yeah. Time is quite tight, and uh, let me uh, make a short comment. Uh, actually, yeah, uh, Dr. Yun is a leading authority uh, on economic security in Korea, and I fully yeah, agree with his comment, and I'm very appreciate. I mean, his point. The first one is uh, uh, the difference between the the de-risking and decoupling. This is a hot topic. Actually, the United States and the European Union is uh, extensively, I mean, discussed about the, uh, this issue, but still unclear what's the main difference between uh, de-risking and decoupling. This is a, a task we have to deal with in coming uh, years. And uh, the, the other point is uh, uh, the, the, uh, the role of the United States. Uh, actually, uh, many uh, experts, uh, uh, even uh, American experts, criticize I mean, the United uh, uh, States, I mean, the sanction policy. Actually, the America is addicted to sanction, uh, some people said, yeah. But uh, Korea, as I said, is uh, uh, hit by the uh, uh, extra uh, territorial, I mean, application of the American sanction against uh, China. And uh, Dr. Uh, Young pointed out that uh, how to deal with, I mean, uh, differently with allies uh, from China. This is a uh, I mean, key issue the America uh, have, uh, uh, has to, I mean, clarify. Uh, and I'm afraid that uh, in Korea, actually, uh, ally shoring or friend shoring is not so welcome as American people expected, because uh, we see it as a kind of uh, external pressure. It's, uh, yeah. And this is why I think that America should, I mean, provide a more friendly, more friendly alternative uh, uh, China's economic caution. Otherwise, I mean, Koreans uh, will concern about the America's real intention especially the America's uh, industrial policy of uh, semiconductor industries and uh, EV batteries. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. We have limited uh, remaining time. Uh, I'd like to open the floor for the general audience. If you have any question or comment, uh, you may raise your hand and ask some questions or give some comment. Nobody? Then let me uh, bring one question to my old friend, you know, Professor Wang Yi. So he mentioned current uh, Korean trade deficit is related with the Korea's uh, the policy change, so leading toward leading more toward the United States. So my question is very simple: When the transition period is over, do you think Korea uh, maintain the trade balance soon? Yes, uh, that's a very tricky question, but uh, I, I think so. Yeah. You think so? Yes. Okay. It is good news then. <laughs> okay, it's good news. Okay, I think you know, this uh, session uh, brings many uh, thorny questions and, you know, uh, and challenges, and I hope you know, this session uh, helps us to understand this current delicate situation and uh, find some solutions. Uh, I'd, like to ask you, I'd like to ask you to give a big uh, hands of the uh, Applause to all participants, and let's close this session. Okay, thank you.